We tend to think of sound and music as being the opposite of silence, or perhaps as being contained within silence. But this is usually because we're not listening closely enough. If you've ever used a microphone to record something in your house or yard, you might be familiar with the experience of hearing sounds that you didn't realize were there. Animals, reverberations, movements, all appearing as if ghosts upon playback. The sound you thought you heard, the sound you did hear, is always one among many. Your recorded voice, too, probably sounds different to you. It's heard from the future, from a vantage point outside the familiar echo chamber of your own head. This applies to electronically generated sound, too. You can crank up the volume on a stereo with nothing playing, and you'll hear the noise that forms the bed for the music you listen to. You can zoom in on no signal with an oscilloscope and visualize this noise floor. You might even be able to zoom in on a sine wave and find that it actually appears to be made of noise. There's no purely flat line or curve anywhere to be found. These characteristics of sound are inevitable because it inhabits the same physical space that we do. There's always more of it lurking just outside our current vantage. The air vibrates, massaging the human ear. The human body contains trillions of microorganisms that cannot be totally separated from human identity. We're rarely explicitly aware of them, but if they were all to disappear, we would quickly perish. Electronic music is made possible by the constant combustive consumption of the corpses of ancient animals or if we're being more conscientious by harnessing the power of trillions of tons of exploding hydrogen in the sun. If there were air molecules in outer space, the sun would be so loud that it would drown out all but the loudest earthly sounds, and humans would likely never have even developed ears. We cannot reliably draw a perfect line or curve between human and non-human, acoustic and electronic, any more than we can noise and silence, or noise and music. We've also been thinking a lot about the design of so-called controllers. The word has certain connotations. You put the system under your control, you tell it to do something, and it does it. But as appealing as the idea might be to transcribe some pure idea from the mind into the physical air molecules via a perfect machine, the actual experience of making music is more akin to a conversation. I'm not controlling my instrument, I'm playing it. Just as important to us as the idea of zero control is the idea that what you patch is what you get. On the surface, that might sound like it contradicts the idea of zero control. But what you patch is what you get. You may not control it in the biggest sense, but you're nevertheless making it happen. The spark of imagination works its way through your fingers, through the touch plates, through the knobs and cables, and encounters the concrete world of the electrons and the vibrating air and the room you're in and the particular angle of the sunbeams cascading through your window and the dust mingles with them in the same air that transmits the music that rubs itself into your eardrums and helps to spark your next idea. I don't mean to suggest that the entire universe is actually one single unified entity or even that a musician and their instrument combine to make one inseparable apparatus. But there are many interlocking multiplicities 
composing us and other parts of the world, all overlapping and simultaneous. And there's no wall we can build that would set the modulation and feedback depth of all these connections to absolute zero. One definition for the word noise is simply unwanted sound. So the drive to make noise intentionally for musical purpose is something of a paradox. The subject and the object appear logically incompatible, make noise. But they meet and exist together nonetheless. For my part, I love to make noise. And I'm also keen to learn about the many ways in which noise makes me.